The book of Acts chapter 20, verse 32. This is the verse that was on my heart, but I want to read the context. We'll start at verse... Paul was here in Ephesus to say goodbye to the elders in Ephesus. And he could say in verse 24, I finish my course. And then he could say um, that he had spoken about the kingdom of God, verse 25, about the counsel of God. And then there's an appeal, verse 28, take heed. Take heed, or be careful, or beware. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock wherein the Holy Spirit has set you as overseers to shepherd the assembly of God, which he has purchased with the blood of his own. So you see, Paul was occupied with the grace of God, verse 24, the glad tidings of the grace of God. He was occupied with preaching the kingdom of God, verse 25. He was occupied to announce all or the full counsel of God, verse 27. He was occupied with the assembly of God, verse 28. And he was occupied with God's sacrifice. He purchased the assembly with the blood of his own, of his own son. Verse 29. For I know this, that there will come in amongst you after my departure grievous wolves, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves shall rise up men, speaking perverted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, watch, remembering that for three years, night and day, I ceased not admonishing each one of you with tears. And now the verse that was on my heart, verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give to you an inheritance among all the sanctified. We could read on, but I was... Well, let's just read to the end of the chapter. We will not speak about that, but just let's continue to read. Verse 33, I have coveted the silver or gold or clothing of no one. Yourselves know that these hands have ministered to my wants and to those who were with me. I have shown you all things that thus laboring we ought to come in aid of the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And having said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore, falling upon the neck of Paul. They ardently kissed him, specially pained by the word which he had said, that they would no more see his face. And they went down with him to the ship. So far the reading of the scriptures. Now how many fingers do you have on two hands together? Two times five is ten. Good. At one time I was studying this chapter, Acts 20, and I found 21 points in which the Apostle Paul is an example to us. I'm not going to speak about those 21 points today. You can figure that out yourself. You need two hands, two feet, plus one more thing, 21 things. What we have today, I will just highlight eight points. And then I leave two fingers left for you to fill in other points that you might find important in this chapter. Now, before we go to verse 32, just the setting. Paul had worked there in Ephesus for about three years. We might think it's a long time. But compared to the 60 years that you have been gathering here, Jake and Helen and some of us, not the whole time of course, Three years is not long compared with that long period. And the three years remind me also of the Lord Jesus. When he had finished his work on this earth, he had a meeting with his disciples in the upper room. And that was his saying goodbye to them. Wonderful teaching that the Lord gave at that moment. Here in this chapter where Paul was saying goodbye to the elders, to the assembly there, 
uh, he could refer back to those three years that he had been with them. And it is a very important chapter. We see Paul's example. And there we see how Paul was an encouragement for all of them. And I want to draw that before I get to the eight points, so you can keep that in mind as a ninth point. I draw this lesson from this. Are we an encouragement to each other? That's why the Lord has put us together in His assembly. God is the great encourager, the God of all comfort. The Lord Jesus on this earth was the great encourager. He encouraged His disciples. And today we can encourage one another. As we learn from the Lord Jesus, as we learn from the Apostle Paul. In the Old Testament you have also a few examples of people who said goodbye. You remember Moses. Moses has led the people through the wilderness. And one day Moses said goodbye to them. It's very, very uh, helpful to study those chapters. There was another leader among God's people. Who came next after Moses? Who was following Moses? Joshua. And Joshua led the people into the promised land. And then when Joshua was 110 years old, it's a bit older than Brother Jake, he was 110 years old when he said goodbye to his people. And you know, you can read that in Joshua 23 and 24. That was a very important message. And then you think of Samuel. When Samuel saw that the people wanted a king, God said, just follow what they desire. It was not God's ideal, but God allowed this to happen. And then Samuel taught them. And at the end, he said goodbye to them in 1 Samuel 12. And so there are important events in life, and it's good to reflect. And I'm sure this afternoon we will hear more about reflections, so I will not say much about that. But when we go to chapter 20 verse 32 now, where Paul had come to the conclusion of his message, where he had spoken about these wonderful things, about the grace of God, about the kingdom of God, about the counsel of God, about the assembly of God, then he made an appeal. And even an event that we have today together implies also an appeal. The appeal is, continue on. The appeal is, verse 31, watch. We need to be watchful because the enemy is all around. Not only that, we have the flesh in us. And so we need to judge ourselves. In that sense, we need to watch. We need to be watchful. And then Paul could refer to them, remember those three years. He was an object lesson to them. Did you know that we can be an object lesson to others? Parents, to the children... And you, young people, you can be an object lesson to the people around you. Did you know that? Paul had been an object lesson to the believers there in Ephesus. He had been an object lesson to the unbelievers, and many got saved. He had been an object lesson to the believers, and many had learned from Paul. And now, as he comes to the conclusion, he says an important thing, and that is in verse 32, and there we come to those eight points that I just want to highlight. I commit. The word commit means um, I entrust you to. It's interesting that this word commit is also the word that's used for deposit. So the verb is to commit or to entrust. It also means to set before. The same word is used when Paul uh, presented from the Old Testament what the Messiah is according to the Scriptures. He set it before them. And so Paul had set things before the believers. And now what he does, he sets them before God. And what I want to draw from this first point, this commitment, this is an, a deposit. He places the believers before God. And that is what we want to do together as we are here today. We place each one before God. Before I say more about this, I want to come back to that word commit. You know when the Lord was on the cross, just before He died, He said, Father, to Thee, I commit my spirit. So the Lord committed Himself to the Father. And here, 
we see that Paul commits the believers to God. And so we may commit ourselves, we commit, may commit each other to God. Not to the elders or to uh, a group of people, not to an organization. In the history of the church there are many institutes that have been formed. People put their trust in those institutions. We can only commit ourselves to God. That's what it says in the King James. In my Greek text it says, to the Lord. So it's both true. Uh, Peter says, First Peter 4, he says that he committed the believers to God as the shepherd. And I want to draw that lesson for all the young people here, the children. When you came into this world, you know what your parents did? They committed you to the shepherd. We have a shepherd. And the shepherd wants to lead us on. And one day, you got saved. I don't know if everyone here is already saved. There are some babies, so they are not saved yet. But the Lord wants to draw them also to himself, that they will become little lambs. And then he's going to lead those lambs on as a flock. We are together as a flock. But we are under the leadership of the good shepherd. And that is the thought now that Paul had. He committed the believers to God, to the shepherd. Did you know God is the great shepherd? Yes, the Lord Jesus is the shepherd. He's the good shepherd because he gave his life. And God is a shepherd who leads the people of God. And so we can commit each other also to the Lord in verse 32. There's another manuscript that I follow that it says the Lord because the Lord is the one who is in control. He is the boss. One time I remember one of our children, we have six children and all born in Holland at one time Number four came with us to the meeting. That time they didn't bring the babies to the meeting like here, which is a good habit. I'm not saying anything against that. But that was not our habit. And so um, the fourth one, she was uh, not easy to take along. So we waited till she was four years old. And then we took her to the meeting. And when we walked in, she, said, she, she asked me, Who's the boss? Who is the boss? That's a good question. That is what we're speaking about. We speak about the Lord. The Lord is the boss. And so Paul committed the believers to the Lord. And are we really obeying the Lord? That is the question for each one of us. We need to commit ourselves to the Lord so that He can be in charge. That He can lead us. That He can guide us. That He can direct us. That He can give orders The Lord is very tender, He is very (coughs) much loving, but we should never forget that He is really the boss. He is my Lord. That's what Paul could say. Can all say this? He is my Lord. That's a great privilege. So Paul commits all of us, and he may commit all of us now, to God, to the Lord, and... And that's the third point, to the word of His grace. The word of His grace. That's a wonderful expression. You know, this morning we read, the word became flesh. The Lord Jesus, He is the word. He is the Logos. And that word means that in Him you see what God is. Hebrews 1 shows that. In the Lord Jesus, in the Logos, you see who God is. He is the substance. He is God. He is also the embodiment of God. He is the Logos. Expresses what God is. And He communicates. That is such a rich word. Um, You can study that in other scriptures later. If you want to make a note. But this is the one with whom we have to do. He is the Logos. He is God. But he's also the Logos who expresses who God is. And he's the living word. So the expression here is. This wonderful person. He is the word. And we are now committed to the word of his grace. 
We're living in a day of grace, right? When did the day of grace start? Acts 2. When the Lord Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came to dwell on this earth, there is where the day of grace started, in which we live. In another sense, the day of grace started when the Lord Jesus came to this earth, because there we see God's grace in the baby. When we see the baby in the manger, we see God's grace. When we see the Lord Jesus walk, and we read uh, about His greatness in Matthew 12, we see at the same time the grace of God. So when we look at the Lord on this earth, we see the grace of God. But it was in Him. Now, after His death, His resurrection, now the day of grace is reaching out to all, and we can have a part in this grace. The moment you believed, you received the grace of God. And so, the word of the of grace is really something that God wants to communicate to all today. And He wants us to be an instrument that this word of grace can be communicated to others. This is the word of grace. Uh, what is grace? Some say this, it is undeserved favor. So, I want you to think about it. Suppose there is a man who is a drug addict, he's gone down, he's poor, he has nothing. And one day, the queen, like in London, England, gives orders to her servants to help that man, to rescue him, and then to feed him, and then to take care of him. Wonderful! But you know, that is just a poor illustration of what God has done. We were so far away from God. When you're a little child, like some of you here, you don't realize yet how far as human beings we were away from God. You can't imagine. Much further than this drug addict was away from the queen. We were much further away from God. And then, that God would reach out to us and then draw us from that environment where we were, from this world, which is under Satan's control, that God would do this in His grace. It is unbelievable that God would give His own Son to make that happen. Who can understand that? Nobody can understand that, but that is the grace of God. But it goes further than that. Not only that God did that for us, what did He do then? Imagine that the Queen would say then to this young man, Today I adopt you as my son. And he would come and live in the palace. There you see an illustration of God's grace. And God has done much more than that. He has accepted us in the beloved. He has given us a place in his own house. You can't imagine the grace of God. And that is now the resource we have. God is our resource. This word of His grace is our resource. Uh, John referred to the conversation he had in the, in the break, and we mentioned what we had also yesterday at the brothers' meeting, how the word of God is sufficient to trace the path and to help us go the path. This is what we have here, the word of His grace. It is sufficient and this word of His grace, and I just want to highlight that when you go back to verse 24, when Paul refers to his service there, he had testified the glad tidings, or the good news, the, the gospel of the grace of God. This grace, as I just gave this illustration, is a poor illustration, but the grace of God, that is what Paul presented there in Ephesus. There were people who had been under the control of demons who had been demon possessed and set free there were people who had sold their souls to the devil they were delivered it's unbelievable what the grace of God had done 
And so, this is the gospel, the good message that reaches those people. But it's not only that. The gospel is what God has done then with these redeemed ones, given him this place of sonship, to be sons together with the Lord Jesus. He is the firstborn among many brethren. And we read this morning a little bit about that in Hebrews 2, what God has done. That is the gospel of the grace of God. But before you can receive that message, you have to go back to verse 21. And that is part of Paul's ministry. He presented to Jews and Greeks the need of repentance. Without repentance, you cannot receive the gift of God. Without really seeing yourself in God's light as a sinner, you cannot receive the gift of God. And so Paul had preached that first. And you know this repentance is towards God. You know what happens? When we grow up as sinners, like I'm not saying now a little child to accept the Lord as a little early age, but I know people have grown up in this world, they went their own way, like the prodigal son. What did the prodigal son do? He turned his back to his father. He went away. That is the idea. We were all on a way in the past away from God. That is the condition of the human race. Turn back to God, go away from God. Now what is repentance? Repentance means you turn around. You turn your face back to God. That's repentance. It's a total change. A change of direction. A change of mind. That is what is needed. And then he says in verse 21, face towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Then you learn to put your trust in Him. Today there are a lot of people that you know, they put a lot of trust in themselves. Now I'm not saying that it is wrong to have the right self-image. As God sees you, we should see ourselves as God sees us. So I'm not speaking against that. I'm speaking about people who put a lot of trust in themselves, but not in God. What we need to learn, when we repent, we say, Lord, I have failed completely. But now, I put my trust in you. And that is, I put, that is the faith that Paul was speaking about. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the moment you are saved. But not only the moment you are saved, you put your trust in the Lord, now, for every second. I was talking at one time with his sister, I think she's here. And I said, you know, uh, you need the Lord's help every day. She said, every moment. I said, yes, amen. Every moment. This faith, putting your trust in the Lord Jesus, is for every moment, till He comes. And another aspect of this grace of God, if you're talking about, is how Paul presented this message in verse 24. The glad tidings, that is, the good news. And that is Romans. You study Romans. You study some parts of Ephesians and Colossians. There you have the whole picture of the gospel of the grace of God. This is what you see in Paul. When Paul got saved, he, was, he found out that he was God's enemy. You know, he had thought he was God's best servant. But when he saw the Lord in the glory on the way to Damascus, then he knew... There was something wrong with him. Probably he had noticed that already earlier when he saw that Stephen was stoned to death. And when Stephen prayed, Lord forgive them. Maybe at that moment Saul's heart was already touched and he thought, hey, there is something that I miss. But then when he saw the Lord in the glory, then he saw who he was, an enemy. And then he started to see how God's grace, how great God's grace is, that God would reach out to such an enemy. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, that he became therefore an object lesson, I use my own word, an example for others. You know, the day that you were saved, God produced something, like he had done in, in Paul's soft Tarsus case, that was a work of God, and that is so tremendous... You know, that, is, that represents the power of God. Did you know that the gospel represents the power of God? The moment you are saved, there was God at work, God's power, God's wisdom. And so Paul presented these wonderful aspects of the grace of God. But now I want to move on, we have not much time left, to who is able. What does it say in the middle of verse 32? 
that the word of his grace is able. That implies also God who is able. There are wonderful scriptures that speak how he is able. You read Ephesians 3 verse 20. If you are in need, you start to pray. And then you realize he is able. But then Paul says he is exceeding abundantly above what we ask or think to do. That is, he is able. Can you just sing that song, he is able? He is able, he is able, I know. that is and that means he is our only resource you know the word able implies the thought of the power that God has Um, we have this in the word dynamite there you have the power so he is able and he is able and that's the fifth point we will go a bit faster now he is able to build you up now, there are a few brothers here who are constructors, builders, and so you know what that means to build up. You start at a foundation. Paul had laid a foundation, and he had built on that foundation, but still, he does not draw attention to that work that he had done. He draws the attention to the one who is able to build. It's God. He started the work. Yes, he used Paul to start his work, but God started the work. And when you started to break bread here, God started the work. He was building, and he laid the foundation, and he built on that foundation. The day that you were saved, God started to build in your life. He laid the foundation, and that moment he started to build. And that is what God is doing. And Paul says, I commit you to him who is able to build you up. We are not able to edify each other, but He is able. And so this word, build up, is used in connection with the house of God. It's used in connection with the body of Christ. The body needs sustenance. The body needs to be nourished. And that is also building up. And believers are here, we are here together as believers. We need each other to build each other up of course the Holy Spirit is going to do it the word of God is going to do it and Paul brings us back to the source he brings us back to the one who is in control but we need to be instruments that he can use in this process of building up and then the sixth point is he points to the giver who is able to give see today we are in a society and that is really the human mind we want to do something in order to get something. And this is not God's concept. God is the great giver. He gave His own Son. How much did we have to pay to receive that gift? Nothing. We did not have to pay anything. He paid it all. He gave His own Son. The Lord Jesus gave Himself. So He is the great giver. And what Paul says now here in verse 32... He commits us to the one who is able to build you up and to give. He is the great giver. He manifests himself in the past as the great giver. And now he manifests himself as the giver because he gives an inheritance. And that's the seventh point. The great giver, you know what he wants to do? He wants to share with us the things that are precious to him. This whole subject could be a study, it could be a whole conference to study the inheritance to study the heir you know God had planned the Lord Jesus to be the heir even before he started the creation 
in Hebrews 1 verse 2 you can see that that God established the Lord Jesus as the heir the Lord was the heir already before the foundation of the world and then when he created everything and then when the Lord Jesus came into this world because of our uh, sinful condition then he did the work that was necessary in order that we would be able to receive that inheritance and that is now the point the, we are heir with the great heir we are co-heirs with him and so this inheritance that God had in mind before the foundation of the world it says that he wants to bring many sons to glory that is what God had in mind and that's my seventh point you can study about that that was only possible because of the death of the Lord Jesus he, and his resurrection and he ushered us into a new scene that the hymn 14 the, at the end of the um, remembrance meeting we thought of the new creation this is where God has introduced us into it is our inheritance and at the same time it's God's inheritance again that would be too much time to study right now the last point is among all the sanctified now we close with that point so you have eight fingers and there are a few more left for other points that you can draw from this chapter I really encourage you to read the whole chapter I found wonderful treasures in this chapter wonderful encouragement if you would just study the word all, for example, or you would study Paul's example. But I close with this point. The Lord has set us free. But not only that, God has set us apart. This word sanctification means God has set us apart for Himself. To be part of this new creation. To be for Him. And so we have now this wonderful portion among those who are sanctified. And that is the great blessing that we have. Yes, we are here on this earth, but we belong already to this new creation. We have been set apart for that. And so together we may rejoice in the Lord Jesus. We may rejoice in what He has given. We may rejoice in this wonderful portion that He has reserved for us. And we may look forward to that. In the meantime, we may be disciples of the Lord Jesus. Everyone here in this room who is saved, everyone who is a believer, you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus. You are a witness. And so we may follow Paul's example until the Lord Jesus come. We may commit one another to Him in view of His soon coming. May the Lord bless us all and bless His word and we commit all to Him. Um, shall I close my prayer or is someone else to do this? I don't know. Go ahead. Good. Our blessed God and Father, we thank Thee for the gift of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank Thee for all that Thou hast told out in Him, wonderful treasures, and that Thou hast reached out to us who are so far away, lost, and Thou hast drawn us to Thyself, brought us to Thyself, and many around us we know have been saved and drawn by the grace of God and thou hast given us the most precious gift thy own son our God and Father thou hast given us eternal life and we may believe in thee we may put our trust in thee help us to do this help us to commit ourselves to thee all the time and draw our resources from thee our God and Father and from the Lord Jesus bless the remainder of this day and bless the young people here especially that all may read the scriptures and study the scriptures and that we may all be doers of the word till the Lord Jesus comes we bless thee our God and Father in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Amen Amen